Okay, evidently we're rolling with technology, and I'm not a tech person, but my tech guy is here. So <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and get started because I know we have a lot to run through, and I just want to be mindful of your time too. Um, I'm typically a start right on time person. Um, so my name is Angela Shirley. Um, I am currently the Director of Early Childhood Education at Christ Community Lutheran School in St. Louis. We are a multi campus program there, so we have four campuses of early childhood that I oversee, and then we have the elementary and middle school as well. So we serve um, 308 little ones from infants through fours, and then we also have our K-8 to school. So um, when I started my ministry, uh, the first 17 years I was in Tennessee, Yay, go Vols and Titans. Um, and uh, that will always be my heart. Uh, but I started in second grade, and then I spent time in middle school, really short time in middle school. That was not my gift. Um, and uh, so we were there for 17 years, and then I took the call up to CCLS, and I've been there for about eight years. Um, so I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk to all of you today. Um, my hope is that in some way, something, that you hear today will be applicable or it's a little nugget that you can take back with you um, you know and you can hopefully apply it in some different ways a lot of what we're talking about today has a really broad application but I kind of zeroed it in on school ministries um, because that's where a lot of you are and um, so these uh, documentation ideas they're certainly applicable to our students very much so but it can also be um, as you're thinking and you're sitting and you're hearing information, this can be used if you're having difficulty with um, teachers that maybe you oversee or, or manage, or maybe it's a colleague or a parent that you're having difficulty with too. Documentation principles are kind of across the board. And then we're going to kind of dive into how to have some of those tough conversations, um, you know, that, that make us all really anxious and we get an icky feeling in our tummy and like we can't sleep that night and then the whole day we like wait the whole day to have it because we keep putting it off, right? So we're going to have some strategies to go into those conversations uh, feeling much better and much more prepared to have them. So that's kind of what today is going to look like. And so um, I want to uh, just kind of start through and feel free to stop me. Um, there's a lot of content. I'm a talker, but I promise I won't, I won't uh, go over time. So let's start first with what documentation is. And here's the best part. I don't read slides to you. I don't go, well, document documentation is a critical written tool. So you have it right there in front of you and you get to take it home with you so you can certainly read through. But what we're really looking at though is a written tool that's going to start helping us analyze and assess where we are, measure and identify these challenging behaviors and those concerning behaviors. Um, it might be an infant who's not yet sitting up on their own at seven months or eight months, nine months, or it can be that um, four-year-old that you're really challenged uh, with some of the behaviors and how it impacts the classroom. So it can be both behavioral challenges or it can be the concerns that you have there in your classroom. And they told me this wouldn't happen. Okay, so let's talk through the purpose of it because this is going to be the, the foundation of everything that we talk about. If you don't have documentation, it makes it very hard for you to have next level conversations with parents, with colleagues, with anybody. So let's look at what the purpose is. So first of all, our primary purpose in the classroom is that we want to support the needs of our students and our staff, right? So as leaders, I need to know if there's children that are really struggling in the classroom. Another thing is to, to validate those patterns and triggers. So you can be like, wow, like every full moon, yeah, we're rocking. Or maybe it's, you know what, when he's on Dad's Week and he's at Dad's house, we see lots of different behaviors than when we see uh, when he's at Mom's house. So this next one, I mean, I would hope that all of our classrooms are safe and developmentally appropriate environments, but what we're looking at is we're trying to optimize that, right? We want to bring our kids to that full potential of where they should be. So in order to optimize our classroom, we're going to have documentation that starts giving us a picture of how we need to be as a teacher and an educator. Then we're going to improve our parent partnerships. Parents can absolutely sabotage what you are trying to do in the classroom if you are not partnering with them. 
so they can compromise all those good efforts and intentions that you have. So we want to make sure that we're in partnership with them. This next one is key because we're going to see some really, um, I'll go ahead and call them scary things that are going to happen in the next couple of years because we've lost so much social emotional intelligence over the last two years that our little ones, our kids, this is the time when all of that is developing and growing in them and we're not teaching them skills right now, right? We're in survival mode with a lot of these kids. So in order to ensure their social emotional health, the documentation is going to help with that. And then individualized learning opportunities. Uh, if our lessons and our plans don't change based on the information we're receiving week after week in our classroom and the feedback we're getting from our students, then we're probably falling down a little bit as a teacher um, in what we should be doing. So unless you have all of those other things, like without documentation, how do I know if the plan I put in place is going to be successful or if it's even needed? Is this something that I have to have? So. Documentation is going to provide you that basis and foundation for that. So, why document? Whoa, they're like, please don't read that slide. Um, there's a lot there, but guess what? It's on your paper too, so you don't have to furiously write through all these notes. I love to keep you engaged, but stop me if I'm going too fast. Anyone notice it's really dry here? Okay. So, one thing that documentation can do, right? You're like, wow, he is unruly in our classroom. Okay, that's a fair statement. But when you qualify and quantify what he's doing, how often he's doing it, when it happens, how it happens, who is he with, what time of day, was it on the playground, was it during transition? All of that is gonna help you understand. So we had a parent that we were meeting with and we're like, wow, we're really having a tough time with gentle hands, our kind words, and you know, this is a little guy, a three-year-old. And um, I was like, well, I mean, what three-year-old doesn't hit his friends? Like what three-year-old you know, doesn't scream and have a temper tantrum when you tell him it's time to transition out of the block area and he's not ready to go? When we said 14 times before 9 a.m., your child hit another child. I mean, that, that's a fact. So when you quantify what you're dealing with, um, documentation becomes much more powerful. It's gonna give you specific evidence of what you're seeing in the classroom. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find those patterns. Are there triggers? Are there antecedents? Are there things that are happening that might be, uh, I can be proactive. And so if I don't do this, or he's not sitting on the circle next to this child, maybe I can proactively help some of those behaviors. Um, great improved communication with parents. Nothing should be a surprise with your parents. We need to be in partnership with them. Um, also, we want to look at the learning environment. So not only am I focusing on this child's behavior and how it's impacting him, right? Like maybe he, I'm sorry, I'm picking on boys, her, um, so maybe she is having a difficult time in the classroom and she's not even getting an opportunity to participate in all of these great activities we have or all of the lessons because there's so much focus on behavior. But I also, my responsibility is not just to look at that one child and how much they pull from the classroom. What's going on with the other 15 three-year-olds? when all of my focus is here. So I have to think about the overall learning environment too, and documentation should include how that's being impacted. Um, it's gonna give you that foundation for a parent conversation. Don't walk into a parent conversation without having thorough documentation of what you need to talk about. Um, and then also, we all know, especially if you're in the early childhood realm, that behavior is communication. I'll go so far as to say that behavior is communication in adults too, right? Easiest emotion to feel is anger, so a lot of things come out angry, but is that what that person's really feeling or how are they, how are they doing? So if behavior is communication, maybe we start looking at kids in a different light, not as somebody who's trying to get under your skin or push your buttons, but a child who's missing skills, essential skills that we need to be teaching them. And then it also allows for self-reflection. I think this is a point that we miss with when we're in the classroom, we're just thinking about, I gotta get that behavior fixed and under control. We're not thinking about, am I doing something 
that might be impacting this child or rubbing him the wrong way or I'm responding in a certain way because when I was growing up this is how we responded in these situations and now woo, look at me projecting that on him so I think it offers us an opportunity for self-reflection uh, it tells us the antecedent sometimes you know what's happening first and second and then also what's working what is not working um, and you got to think slow cooker here and not microwave okay so let's say that you implement a new strategy in the classroom and you've given it two days and you're like nope not working right I mean we don't any of us we don't learn skills and habits in less than 21 days or whatever they say um, so we want to make sure that we're giving them ample opportunity and that we're you know reinforcing reinforcing every day that same pattern so that we're able to figure out did that really work rather than well it didn't work the first day so we're just going to give up on that one and then also this is going to be your advocate when you're looking at special school district or first steps or parents as partners or whatever the organizations are in your area that it might be time for additional evaluation so it's time for us to move forward with that so documentation it's got a lot to it right this is not just a nugget this is you know this is going to be foundational for your success in the classroom so documentation should be student behaviors and interactions right that's what it should include that's what it should include observable too many times our documentation includes inferences intentions and sub assumptions interpretations suggestive motives emotional influences so again that goes back to like he is totally trying to push my buttons right thinking that that's really why that child is acting out or suggestive motives like he was so aggressively trying to hurt his friend do you know that? Are you sure that that's what it was? And again, emotional influences, how you respond to that child's behavior, that's going to give a lot of, uh, it's going to give a very narrow lens um, to how you're responding to different situations. So we don't want to have any of those things included. If I can observe it and I can see it, then I write it but I keep out all of those other qualifying um, adverbs and adjectives and things like that. So, objective, observable behaviors, right? So you might have subjective thoughts about why this is happening or what's going on, but anything that you're gonna share with a parent better be objective, right? Or they will call you on it and they'll raise you one. All right, so again, he did that on purpose. He tried to hurt her. He is having a very bad day. Um, he doesn't want to listen. He totally knows better. We've gone over this a hundred times, right? Those are all those inferences where we're really assuming what a child's behavior is saying. So what is it? What, what is the actual behavior? Is it that he physically hurt another child when he picked up the chair, got ready to throw it. Have you seen that in a three-year-old room? Oh, just our rooms? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so what was the actual observable behavior? That's what you want to document. Who or what was affected? You're not going to share that part with parents, right? Even though most kids tell on themselves, I did that to so-and-so. Um, so anyways, then the, the two words that I want you to walk away with is if you're documenting a student's behavior or a developmental concern you're gonna think about frequency and intensity those are your two big words there's a reason that you started documenting on this child right so like we were talking uh, last week uh, in the world of illness and um, you know kids who are like miraculously healed as soon as they get home and they have no more fever and they want to come back the next day right we were talking about that and so what we said is like on our forms when we're sending these home to parents okay so the fever magically went away right um, or they gave them the purple medicine and the kids tell on that too um, but they're like okay no they didn't have a fever the rest of the day so we'll be back at school tomorrow there is a reason that you took that child's temperature. What was it? It was that they were congested, they didn't eat their snack, they were laying under the sand, or sand table instead of playing in the sand table, they were unusually clingy or they were crying or whatever, right? There's always things that kind of are making you think, all right, what is it? So we wanna include that on our, um, 
on our conversations. So one of the phrases that I have taught my staff to say, and we practice it over and over, there's a couple of them that I'm kind of like a broken record on. The first one is say, I regret. I regret that that was so hard. Don't say I'm sorry if you didn't do something wrong. Right? So that's my first thing. That's my first nugget. The next one, don't ever use the word normal. When you're talking to a parent about their child's behavior, our phrase is, you know, this is different than what we might typically see at this age. This is different than what we might, might typically see at this developmental stage. This is different than what we typically see. We don't talk normal. Normal makes parents elevate really quickly and it puts up a wall because now they think you're attacking their child and mama bear comes out of hibernation really, really fast. So don't use the word normal. All right. So you're like, I know there's other things going on. What do, how do, where do I write all that down? Well, you totally include it in your documentation just not what you share with the parents, right? So your additional documentation that you're gonna have, all right, we all know that we have one little guy that goes after the twins. They're so cute. Um, really, I mean, I can, I can see why, like maybe he's, you know, enjoying the, you know, how cute they are and that they always play fun stuff and everything, but he targets them and it comes out angry and mean and aggressive, right? So we started figuring out like, oh, he's going after the twins. Okay, suggest or identify patterns. Okay, this is where you can do the little investigative work. Like it kind of seems like we're starting to see this emerge. The antecedent, like maybe what it is that's tripping that, that wire and making that behavior happen. Maybe you're starting to think next steps. Like, okay, this is not responding to this. The, you know, the consequences, I guess we can call them. Um, it's not responding to this. It's not responding to this. Hey, we got him to like stop and pause when we used this particular strategy. So you're gonna have some of those things on there too because you will share with parents later how you have addressed things in the classroom. You have to show them that. So you want to make sure you're doing that. And then which teachers witnessed and who was involved and who intervenes. I mean, let me tell you, that same little guy who goes after our twins, when Miss Gerilyn comes in, he turns into a big pile of mushy love. I don't know why. What is it that he, re why does he respond to Miss Gerilyn so differently than he responds to Miss Lisa? You know what, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna do some observation. I'm gonna start helping them kind of identify what is it that he responds to so well with that other teacher. And then outplan outlining a plan that you're gonna have moving forward. So you're gonna wanna include all of that, but you're not necessarily gonna share all of that with the parents. So this is the next big thing. We, uh, I, I talk about communication all the time because I will go so far as to say that uh, misunderstandings, frustrations, tensions, all of those, about 95% of them have to do with communication. And it's a, it's a lost art. We really are losing it. Now we sit behind a compu computer screen and we type out things to like people that we don't even know, halfway across the world, right? Um, so in your classroom though, it shouldn't be like that where it's behind some screen. You might have before care teachers, you might have after school teachers, you might have a sub that's in there. You might have you know, different lead teachers that share Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday. So if you don't develop a plan with everybody that's in your classroom, you're gonna have breakdown of communication, and the afternoon teacher's like, everything breaks loose the moment the lead teacher leaves. And the last two hours of the day are horrendous. Did she share that with the morning teacher? Did she share that with the lead teacher? Or now are we feeling a little resentful, like, well, when she leaves, I don't get any help, and now I'm, you know. So how are we gonna communicate this? Okay, so first thing, the conversations are not happening. I know, like, everybody knows this, but I feel like I have to say it. They don't happen in front of other students, over that student, um, with other parents. You know, talking about things in the hallway as parents are dropping off and picking up, not the best time to talk about specific um, challenges that you're having. So everybody's different, and I don't know what works for you, right? In our program, we love Google Docs and Google Folders because no matter if I'm a morning teacher, an afternoon teacher, a lead teacher, the assistant, the sub, whoever comes in, they have access to the same document that's updated in real time. 
So I love Google um, and what that's done. Uh, I do have one teacher that she just loves it. She's got a wire bound notebook right there sitting up there on her desk and every day she writes her little notes and the little afternoon teacher will she's so sweet she'll be like oh my goodness we did this cute thing and sent this one home vomiting and so that the morning person comes in and goes good deal I shouldn't see Isaiah today he was sent home vomiting right so that's how they communicate and it works for them. Um, you know is it a clipboard in the classroom where everybody knows where the clipboard is and you've got something like please cover it the top sheet so that people aren't seeing the names of the kids that you're documenting. Um, but whatever that is, I don't micromanage that. And I, I would argue that I don't think you should either because what works for one of my teachers does not work for another. She doesn't work that way. She doesn't think that way. But make sure that everybody has the same access to information. If an aftercare, after school teacher is responsible for those children and we're like, well, but she's not the lead. So, I mean, it makes them feel like they're not a partner. We, we obviously have, uh, you know, in our society, this idea of hierarchical type of um, arrangements in our classrooms and in our schools, like this person's above this person and this person just, we don't use the word just in our school, just this, or I'm only this, right? Everybody has an equal part but different roles and responsibilities. So there is a lead, and she has very specific, uh, very well clarified uh, roles that she has to do in the classroom, just like the assistants do, right? But make sure that everybody has equal access so you don't unknowingly cause some friction in the classroom because everybody feels like they're not being communicated with. So, so my big sticking point is that, you know, the handwritten notes that you're making, the daily tally sheets, the complete assessment screenings, all of those kind of things, like we use brigands, you know, we don't share that whole thing with the parents. What we do is we share summaries with parents. Parents don't need the nitty gritty. That one parent needed to know it was 14 times before 9 o'clock, right? But otherwise, we don't need to have all of that. So I like the idea of typed summaries. Um, and so, you know, whether it's I make a copy so that I keep it for my file or maybe it's an email so I now have a paper trail, whatever method you use, um, you know, I give my teachers a lot of uh, autonomy to be able to do that. But so logistically, you're like, well, how are we going to do this? Like, am I going to really sit down and write down? So the antecedent seems to be... You're like, I got 24 year olds running around this room. I don't have time to do that. So guess what? It won't happen. It'll be haphazard. It won't be complete unless you as a classroom team or you as a school have a plan on how it's gonna be done. So is it, okay, where is the clipboard gonna be? Let's talk about it. Or like, am I gonna take shorthand notes during the day and then during nap time or after school, that's gonna be my quiet time where I process and I kind of make more complete notes at that point. Tallying is your friend, especially in the early childhood realm because it happens fast. It's like rapid fire succession, things going on in the room. So tallying is a really quick way to be able to do that. Um, but you have to talk as a team and know what your process is gonna be. So. You know, we have um, times a day where there are three teachers in the classroom where there's an overlap of the morning and the afternoon assistant so that the afternoon crew can kind of get up to speed. And then you've got two teachers that are kind of working on lunch, et cetera. And then the other one might be processing those notes. It might be the lead teacher over there, you know, kind of giving some updates about the morning. But talk about it. When are we going to do this? How are we going to do this in our busy classrooms and busy days? Um, you can use your phones for quick notes. A lot of you do it, speak it, use Evernotes, whatever it is, you've got to, you have to go in with a plan or it won't happen and you're going to walk into a parent meeting and feel totally unprepared. So your foundation for change in the classroom is documentation. So uh, I give my teachers so much autonomy. I love them. I trust them. They are wonderful professional women. And I, one guy, uh, yeah, we have like 73 ladies and one guy on my team. Uh, so anyways, Mr. Michael, we love him. Um, he's like a human jungle gym because he's 6'5 and he works with three-year-olds. Um, okay, anyways, so these examples are things that my teachers have developed because every brain works differently. So we, as we talk about documentation, I'm like, search the internet, find a template that works for you, 
and I roll with it because I'm again I'm not going to micromanage how a teacher does that so it might be something like okay we're really noticing you know with Trevor today like he is like he is spitting Ugh. It's really gross, especially during COVID. Come on, Trevor. Um, and then also he is hitting kids. Like something happens, boom, like, you know, he attacks. So I'm going to just do it. So I'm just circling a number one time, two time, three time. I'm just circ I mean, how easy is that to do if it's right accessible for you? Um, so, you know, this might be more like elementary where you're talking about off task, refusing to work, out of seat, talking. I would have had so many tallies for that. Um, I, I am sure, you know, and you can adapt any one of these. You know, maybe um, it's not about, you know, we've got one little guy that he'll, he'll pound his head on the floor. He will hit himself. He will bite himself when he's upset. I want to track that. And I want to know. So these aren't things that like, oh, well, this doesn't really apply. Have a form that applies to him so that you're able to um, accurately track things. Um, so these, like this is just a big old tally sheet that, uh, that Ms. Kirsten uses. And so it might be like in the classroom or in the playground, like non-compliance or throwing things or avoidance of a group activity. I want to figure out like, why is he withdrawing? so much, right? It might not be an acting out behavior. There's a lot of other behaviors that are concerning too. So again, super adaptable. And then at the end of the day, doo -doo -doo -doo, she puts all of her little notes in there. Um, this one was a little more complicated for me. So I simplified it for you guys. So, uh, so this teacher had like um, one, two, three, four, like next to the behavior and then how she responded. So let's say that the child was, um, let's see, he was, you know, running away or like non-compliant about something. So she would do four and she redirected him one. So she knew exactly what the behavior was and how she had responded it. So that later in the day, as she's going back and maybe making more formal notes, she's like, Oh, that's right. Okay, I remember that specific circumstance. Because you had a lot going on. Like, have you ever Googled how many decisions your brain makes in a day? Don't do it. That's why we're tired. <laughs> There's a lot going on in our brains. Um, but if I do something that kind of helps me remember, um, and then, you know, this again is just X boxes. One of them just does X boxes. Um, some of these, uh, they are uh, adaptable for infant and toddlers. So it might be something like, you know, they're trying to really encourage, um, you know, him to sit up or whatever. We had one little girl that, I mean, you tried to stand her up and she just went flop. Like she just had no money muscle tone at all. So the teachers were, you know, trying to say like, okay, we did this at this time and this was the response. We did this at this time, this was the response. So a lot of these can be really adaptable too. Um, you know, for infant, toddlers, number of occurrences, your notes. It's whatever the form looks like that works for your brain, that works for your classroom, that works for your age group. Um, so it, it's really up to you completely. So as you're talking to your team about this and you go back, these are some great things for you to talk about in the classroom as you share like, hey, I want to do this documentation thing better so that we can be more effective. So how might these forms help you track them? Which of these forms might be useful for you? Which one works with your brain? Um, what are the challenges? So, okay, what are we going to face? Like we've got this sheet or we've got this process. What kind of challenges are we going to face during the day? And how can we overcome them? What could you be doing while I'm doing this so that we're able to get the documentation completed? So da, 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 da. it's time for a meeting with parents. <laughs> so how do I know that it's time for a meeting with parents? Bottle one down. All right. So you have behaviors that are so disruptive to the classroom, the learning environment, for other kids, for that child. They're not learning either because we're in constant like one-on-one -on -one redirect mode. When they are so disruptive to the classroom that you can't accomplish your goals, your job, right? I want to educate. I want to spend time with you. I want to engage with you. I don't want to be in constant redirect mode, right? The student isn't responding to your typical moves. All y'all got moves. You know you do, and, and most kids are going to respond to those really well. But this one is not responding to these typical um, redirect. Multiple strategies. I've enlisted the help of other teachers. I went and I talked to my, my director or my principal. We have tried every strategy known to man, and we give every one of them 
a two to four week period, right? And you, I'm not saying like one at a time. You could have like three different strategies at work at once in your classroom, but give it some time. It's a slow cooker, okay? Um, and then finally, so let's say you have uh, worked with other specialists. We're super blessed. We have LFCS, which is Lutheran Family and Children's Services. They provide us counselors. And then LACE, the Lutheran Association for Special Education. We have two early childhood um, specialists that come into the classroom and try to help us. And, you know, they'll model things for teachers by like, hey, look at how this is, is working for this little one. Or they might suggest, you know, here are things that you can do in the classroom when we're not there um, and, and they're like yeah it's time for further evaluation there's something a little bit more next level that's going on and then I had to add in there you're helpless hopes hopeless exasperated and you are just ready to throw in the towel we shouldn't get to that point before we have a meeting with parents okay but don't let it be a surprise <laughs> so true story Excellent teacher, master teacher, and we have one of our, you know, a, a really difficult family situation, and dad's so involved with this, uh, with this little guy's, uh, I'll call him Micah. Okay, so uh, Micah has the most loving father who says, I will pay for him to go full-time to your program to hold his spot, but every other week he won't be in attendance. He's with mom that week and she refuses to send him there. Okay, so already, yeah, you're all going, that's not good, <laughs> right? So I told the judge when I was subpoenaed. Um, but I don't know, I guess he's not an educator. Um, so anyways, so really, really tough situation. And I mean, name a behavior, and I promise we've seen it, experienced it, done it, been there, and probably 25 times. Uh, so it was definitely time, you know, to sit down with Micah's dad and say, you know what, um, things, are, things are tough right now in the classroom and we just want to share with you some of those things, right? So the teacher comes in and we're kind of debriefing what you're going to learn about next, uh, our SBAR meeting. And uh, I said, okay, so how has dad been responding? Like as you've kind of shared some of the difficulties in your day. And she goes, well, I don't know. We haven't had the meeting yet. So this little guy had been at our school uh, for almost four weeks, only half of the time, right? And Dad had no clue that it was 14 times before 9 a.m., right? And so, <laughs> surprise, <laughs> when I called Dad to confirm our meeting, because uh, we we're just going to sit down and come up with a plan um, for Micah, he was floored, shocked. What are you talking about? Like, I, I, I thought everything was going okay and that everything was really good at school because I never heard from the teacher. So, right, so we've, yes, and we've processed through that and we know how we're going to move forward better, right? Okay, with this awesome teacher. She was just, I think she was so overwhelmed and so scared because dad has dealt with so much. There's so much on his plate and it's like, you don't want to go like, all right, so <laughs> he's our spitter, our biter, our, our kicker, our throw chairs. He's, he's our everything. Um, and you haven't shared that yet. I know it's hard. But if we're not being transparent with our parents about what's really happening in the classroom, you're going to continue to experience it, and you're not going to have any support at home. Um, I'll tell you about later how, we, uh, how we've kind of rectified that situation. So... Super important about communication. Remember, communication, that's my wheelhouse. So, how are we communicating beforehand? I don't know what things you employ. Maybe you have Bright Wheel in your program, which we love. That has been transformational. And if you don't have it, look into it. It's, it's really, really great. Um, it's a one-way one communication. They can't communicate with other parents on the platform, but directly with you. You can send messages, alerts. Um, you can do, hey, he had a VM today. They're like, yes, I knew it. Um, yeah. Tadpoles, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there are a million. Find the one that works for you, right? Like, how are you communicating? Make sure you are communicating. And then, you know, it might be text messages, email, face-to-face, -face, phone conversations. You're like, wait, I'm sharing all of this hard stuff, like, by, by email? Emails for information, not emotion. I really write it down. That's a good one, <laughs> right? So... 
I should not be sharing all of that kind of stuff in an email. My email is going to look really different. We're going to walk through some samples. And so I love the face-to-face -face because I can read where you are. I can scale back if I need to, right? And I don't see like steam coming out their ears, right? Whereas I can, I can pick up on that and I can kind of pivot and make things happen. Um, phone conversations, that would, that would be another good way because you can hear tone and voice, you know, and how things are being received. So that's the thing. How is it going to be received? My favorite phrase, the only message that matters is the one that's received. You might not have the intentions to offend that person, make that person upset, hurt them, um, bring them out of hibernation. Um, so it doesn't matter. That is how it was received. And the person is going to receive it in their frame of reference, inside their content, uh, context, based on their experiences. They have a totally different lens than you. So when you're communicating with someone, that's why I say emails for information, not emotion. Because uh, we, we want to be communicating with them, not just when there is a problem either. So parents have to know that you care about their child and that you know their child before they care one bit about what you're going to say in a difficult meeting or in a difficult message. So if you don't have a relationship with the child and the only time you're ever coming to them is like, well, he did this, he did this, he did this, oh yeah, but we had a great day, you know, they don't believe you. That's not genuine communication. So make sure that before this ever happens, you've already built a relationship with that family by sharing the positives, the cute pictures. How about touching base with them and going, hey, how are you guys doing? We're a few weeks into the school year. Uh, how is Nathaniel enjoying school? Are there, is there anything I need to know about that's going on? Like you have to have that conversation with your parents because not I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you don't even see parents because uh, they're dropped off or picked up at a time when you know you're not already there. Um, so they have to know that you have a relationship with them too. Now the second part, all written, all verbal communication should be direct and kind. I'd go ahead and throw respect in there too. If you haven't read the Crazy Cycle, it's a great read. You really should read it. Um, so if, if you don't, you know, treat me with love, then I'm not going to respect you, and you're not giving me respect, so I'm not going to love you, and it's, it's a vicious cycle. So it has to be, notice I didn't say fluffy, that it all has to just be kind and mushkush and, and all is well in, the, in our world. So the all caps, the multiple punctuation marks, emojis, right, that's how we talk now. Um, I avoid those completely when I'm talking with parents, unless it's something like, wait, wait, baby's on the body. Throw an emoji in there. Sure. Uh, but when we're talking about this kind of stuff, we want to avoid that. All caps and multiple punctuation marks, that's yelling at people in print. Right? So also like with emojis and, and thoughts. So um, we'll, we'll talk about an example in a minute. So we're not trying to appease parents when we go into these tough conversations with them. We're trying to inform them. Walk into a meeting thinking, boy, I'm going to hit them with some really tough information, but I'm not trying to just you know, gloss this over. I'm trying to inform them what the day looks like during the six, eight, ten hours that they're not with their child. Also, remember that they're going to receive it through their lens of emotions. Did I have a good day? Did I have a cranky day? Did I get a flat tire? Um, you know, maybe uh, this is triggering something for me from my past. You know, that little CD-ROM is kind of going in the brain. Um, so they're not going to hear it through your lens. So you might think it's just the nicest, kindest way to tell somebody something. And you have to be prepared for the, wow, this is not what I expected this meeting to do. I did not expect that. Right? You've sat in conversations or meetings and had parent conversations where you're like, oh, okay, what do I do? I totally didn't expect dad to like get up, smack the table, start walking out of the room. So have a staff member right, do your uh, communication. But the one thing, this is, this can be your nugget to take away, okay? Before you ever have that tough phone conversation, before you ever have that meeting, the SBAR that we'll kind of walk through here in just a minute, you're going to write it out. And this is the advice that I walk all of my teachers through before they have a tough conversation with a colleague or maybe their campus manager or the parent or, you know, whatever it is. So 
I physically sit down and I write out before I pick up the phone, um, this is what I need to say. Right? You can do that without emotion and fear if you haven't yet made the phone call. Right? So what do I want to say? What do I want to communicate to this person? Okay. Then here comes the next part. What am I going to do if dad erupts and gets super angry? What's my response? Okay. I'm going to say, wow, Mr. Smith, it looks like we, you know, we've really touched on a subject that's really tough right now and it hits some nerves and I want to move forward in a productive way with you and I want to make sure that our mutual end goal of wanting what's best for your child is accomplished. So let's reschedule for 24 hours or let's do, you know, write out what you're going to do if they're angry. What if you get the silent treatment and you're met like with stone cold face? What are you going to do? What are you going to say? And the beautiful thing that happens is the moment that you're writing, your hand's doing it, one part of the brain. Your eyes are seeing it, another part of the brain. You're logically thinking it, another part of the brain. And it's all using that really good like prefrontal cortex. Oh, I love brain stuff. Prefrontal cortex, right? Because you get in that meeting and you've not prepared for the angry outburst or the stone cold silence you are going to be in that fight or flight middle or limbic system emotion in a hot second and those parts turn off all of our critical thinking and our logic and our ability to form good sentences <laughs> blah, 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 right but if you've thought about it ahead of time and you've written it out you've made that connection there you're prepared so now i don't know how it's going to go in that meeting but i'm ready for whatever i think is going to come my way and most of the part, you know, everybody, you know, we always get surprises, but at least I'm prepared. So, um, what I want to do is uh, I want to kind of dispel this myth of the, the Oreo. Tell them something good. Then go through the mushy, icky stuff. And then end it good. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a good approach uh, to tell parents good things. This is... Um, from one of my teachers, I told her I wouldn't name her by name, but she gave me permission. So she is my ultimate emoji girl, like the thousands of exclamation points, hearts, 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 you know, this is how she, and she is, she's a big pile of love. She's an awesome early childhood teacher. So she goes, Charlie had a great morning playing with his friends and he was an awesome line leader. We had a little bit of trouble with kind hands, but then we had a super fun afternoon. Have a great evening. That parent meeting went ex almost the same as our little guy, Micah. Parents are like, what are you talking about? He's doing great. Loves being a line leader, all that. So it got missed because of that. So I'm not saying, you know, don't include it. What if instead, huh, oh, we've got some delay, the suspense. Okay, so maybe this is what it's going to look like, okay? Tell me if you, as a parent, received this, how it would come across. Just wanted to let you know that Charlie's had a bit of rough day with gentle hands. I'll send an email uh, with a few details later. I'm encouraging him to, and I'd love to have you talk about it with him as well so that our days can be more successful at school. Thanks. Did I tell the parent what's going on? Am I going to just incite all of this rage over this? No, the parent's going to go, whoa, Charlie, what's going on with your hands? Miss Tina said you're having a really tough time with gentle hands with your friends. Why is that? Like, let's sit down and chat about it, right? So it's not that I'm saying you can't send good things. I'm just saying make sure your message is the message you want them to hear. Make sure it's the one that needs to be received. Um, duplicates, wow. All right, so face-to-face -face example. We had a little guy that wasn't hearing. We were like, he's not turning his head like you would expect you know, someone to do. So, okay, so I noticed recently, this is a face-to-face -face with the parent. Maybe at pickup time or maybe like, hey, do you have a quick second? I wanna chat with you really quick. I noticed recently there are times when Charlie doesn't respond when I call his name, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about his hearing, so I'd love to have an opportunity to, to talk with you about it so we can make sure he, like, he's on track and he's going to be successful in our classroom. So I'm telling them the concern, right? Because as a teacher, like when this teacher came up to me, she's like, oh my gosh, I don't think, I don't think he's hearing. 
I think there's something wrong with his hearing. I'm going to have to tell his parents, like, I think there's something wrong with his hearing. So she's imagining, like, what did you say about my baby, <laughs> right? She's imagining that kind of response from the parents. But we have to be able to do that. We have to have, give ourselves permission to share hard things in good ways that are going to be well-received. So, wow, everything's a duplicate now. All right, great. Um, I hate technology. You can text Will that. All right, so uh, this might be an example of what you might see uh, one of our teachers as they sit down and kind of write out their other notes. I just wanted to kind of give you evidence of, like, these are the kind of things that you might, you know, start to summarize and share with parents. So in solitary play, so what have I... I've, I've told you, like, he's by himself, right? Like, so no other kids are around. Um, Charlie was making a block tower. Two students asked if they could join. Charlie yelled at the two kids and told them they couldn't play. Charlie knocked the tower to the ground and moved to another area of the classroom, and the two other children left the block area. I went, here is what I completely observed with my own eyes. So then... Here's where I might go, okay, so he likes solitary play, maybe self-directive. He's like really imaginative, so he's got that going. Uh, but his trigger is that when other kids want to join him, and maybe they might mess up the tower or something. So his communication is through verbal and physical aggression. Uh, the consequence was that his play was disruptive, and the other children didn't want to play with him. So I can share with parents... Oh boy, there we go. Um, you know, that information, but what is mine not going to include when I'm talking to those parents? I will never include, even if they go, it's Amelia, isn't it? I'll be like, well, what I'm really here to talk about is Charlie, because I love and care about him. So let's talk about how we can have a good path moving forward. We'll uh, include strategies and outcomes of like what worked and what didn't. So we tried this. It really didn't seem to have an impact over the course of a couple weeks. So we kind of changed our tra trajectory and tried something new. I'm totally fine with quantifiable evidence. 14 times before 9 a.m. makes a big impact when you're talking to parents. And I avoid qualifying adjectives. Oh, that will bring out hibernation too, right? Because if you like very bad aggressively hit again you're assuming that he was trying to be aggressive in what he said I always say type it it's a professional thing it's an excellent thing but it's also so that you have a trail a paper trail of some kind of exactly what was said that's a protection for you and you know what that also does is it helps your your principal your director really support you if it takes that next level conversation where the director is being brought in to the meeting so i can fully support all of the communication that's been shared so and have him proofread so bad when we're in schools and we send home stuff with spelling errors right so have someone proofread so let's talk about what the meeting looks like i don't know if any any of you ever heard of an s bar you don't count. You're at my school. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, an S bar, to give you like the teeniest, tiniest amount of, of background on this. So, it actually was a concept that was started on nuclear submarines. And it was because they were having simple errors that meant big mistakes. So they developed this system of a very uh, systematic approach to um, this is what happened and this is what's going on. In the so then, like this S bar idea, kind of emerged into healthcare. Like, whoops a daisy, we operated on the wrong knee. <laughs> Right? And it happens. Uh, so, so how do they do that? So then medical fields started to adopt this idea of S-bars and making sure that communication was super clear and, and everybody understood where we were. So as I read about that and I heard about that, because there's a really great book out there called Turn the Ship Around by David Marquette, um, and he kind of shows how this plays out on a, on a nuclear submarine. He took it from the worst submarine in the fleet to the best after he transformed and turned things around. If you're not reading a book about what you do professionally, you might be dying as a professional. Make sure you're always reading and you have an insatiable knowledge to be better. Okay, I get easily sidetracked. So, SBAR, it's situation, background, assessment, recommendation. You're like, how does this really work? This sounds very prescribed. It sounds very um, mechanical or something. 
It's not. It just gives you the framework. You have to have the framework. And again, as you're developing this S-bar, you're thinking about it, you're writing it, your eyes are seeing it, your ears might be saying it out loud. I always read my stuff to myself out loud. I catch a lot of things when I read it back to myself. Um, so let's look at what each one of those mean, and then I'm going to show you an example of what that really looks like in real life. So situation. This is a clear statement about the challenge or issue that you are having. It's short. This is not a dissertation. This is, Charlie is demonstrating concerning behaviors at school that have presented daily in elevating frequency and intensity. Many skills are not as fully developed as we would typically see in a three-year-old student. Self-regulation, social-emotional skills, and potty training. So, I have just set the tone for the meeting. We all know where we are and why we're there. Next comes the background, and this is the hard part. You might have to take this much documentation and make it simple. You have to summarize it. And if you hit a parent with 22 bullet points about what's going on with Charlie in the classroom that's not desirable, you have completely killed your meeting. I frequently say, find your three to five. If it goes over five, that's time for another meeting. Three to five. Let it be digestible as you sit there and you talk. So notice all of these have no um, emotion to them. These are observable things. Hitting, kicking, pushing students unprovoked. Right? I can see that another child didn't walk up and go, mm, you know, cr causing it. Um, screaming, shrieking, and noncompliance. Tantrums. Again, I can hear it. I can see it. Running from the classroom and from teachers. Hitting self and other sensory seeking behaviors. And then I might talk about the teacher challenges, right? We have to talk about what we've been doing in the classroom, too. So here's, here's the student and the behaviors. So here's how it's impacted our classroom. Charlie requires significant individualized attention 90% of the day. There's a good qualifier, right? Quantify, qualify. In order to redirect and proactively minimize negative impact on classroom and students, classrooms frequently out of ratio as one student or one teacher is required to care for Charlie's needs. And we have to let him know. One-on-one -on -one assistance is not feasible within our staffing structure at our school. We don't have paras, okay? So now I've given some very, just like very specific background. Here's what we're doing. This is kind of the challenge that we're facing. And now it's time for the assessment. And this is the hard part, okay? Because this is the time where the parent has to give you feedback about what they're hearing. They have to say, well, you know what? You know, this and that and the other, or I think it's this, or you should try this, or you should do that. So you have to analyze and consider all options. You have to have a discussion of what's been done, what could be done. And guess what? On your sheet, you're allowing for it to be open. You're not going to go, but, 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 no, we, we, we tried that. It didn't work, right? This is where you just have to receive. And you have to be ready to just sit down and write what you're saying. I write everything. Not to freak people out, but I want them to know that I'm hearing exactly. I document at every meeting that I sit at. You can testify to that, right? Every phone call that I have, I write what the person's saying on the line. I document the time and date that that phone call is happening. I, I write it out. What did I say? What did they say? Where did we leave things? Do I need to follow up? We do the same thing here to show parents like, oh, well, he's been, you know, really tired lately, not sleeping well, you know. So I'm hearing and I'm showing them evidence that I'm, I'm engaged in what they're saying. No judgments about it. No defensiveness. Um, and so all strategies, ideas, options should be recorded on your paper and considered. And you know, sometimes parents do have good ideas, even though like we're the professional experts, right? But still, they might have a great idea of something that's worked at home and um, next thing you know. All right, so then comes the R, the recommendation. So these are kind of your next steps forward. These are not developed within the meeting. You might add to it in the meeting, but this is something that you and your team have talked about and worked out beforehand. So. For example, in ours, 
enlist the support of our LACE early childhood specialists. They are awesome. And uh, they see things we don't see. And okay, so what needs to happen in there? Okay, we're going to explore some play based therapies with our counselor. Um, so we're going to actively pursue some screening with his local school district so that he can um, be evaluated. And we're also going to look at, you know what, that potty timer, that's a really good idea. Or uh, co additional calming strategies. Or what are we going to put into the classroom? Now, the parent might have that suggestion. Write it on the sheet. Let them know that you value their input. They're the parents, right? So what does it look like? That. That's it. It is not front and back. It is not two pages. It's not four pages. And it's definitely not ten. <laughs> it's a one-sider. So your S bar, and I really do it. I, here's our situation. Here's our background. Here's our time for open discussion. I'm writing all kinds of notes on that. And then here's the recommendations for continued enrollment. Don't miss this important piece. Don't let the meeting end until you have figured out a follow-up date. What works with your calendar? You want to grab out your calendar? What's going to work next? If you happen to not have that on your sheet and you don't have like the follow-up meeting scheduled, what I do is at the end of the day, I think about the conversations I've had, you know, maybe I talked to that parent and I said, okay, so here's, here's our plan moving forward. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to follow up with you, okay? So I jump to my Google Calendar and I write follow up with Mrs. Smith 14 days ahead from that. I let them know that I haven't forgotten them, that I value them, that I care about making things better for their child, for the classroom. Put it, calendar it, so that you know you're going to follow up. I always say typed, right? Handwritten, you know, some people's handwriting is hard to read. <laughs> um, but typed. And school logo, this is, this is professional. This is you saying, hey, we're at this point. It shouldn't be, you know, a chicken scratch note that you hand to a parent. Do everything you do with excellence. One copy for each person. Okay, so as you start that meeting, I have one copy. I don't have the documentation file sitting with me. I don't need it. We've processed it already. I've got a sheet of paper in front of me, and the parents get it. And if anyone else is there, the teacher's there, they get a copy as well, so everybody can be taking notes. And you take notes, right? I literally wrote on the sheet, Dad is disengaging. Remember that? Maverick's disengaging. Top Gun? OK. No, really, like I saw him, woo. Like he shut down the moment that his precious little peanut <laughs> was maybe not doing as well as he thought he was. Um, so I note, um, you know, fidgety, mom isn't making eye contact. You know, I, I kind of make note of how things are being received. Um, and then I always let, I, I tell my teachers, Oh, if you're going to have an S bar, don't surprise me. I want to support you. I want to help you. If that parent leaves that meeting and goes, can you believe everything? And I'm like, yeah, we've, we've discussed it. It sounds like we have a really good plan moving forward. Do you have other thoughts that you want to share with me? Or have you had some ideas after you, you know, had a chance to churn? Um, but I'm going to support and back my teachers 100%. So don't let it be a surprise to those that might be um, helping you along the way. So again, really the books. Oh gosh, if you have not read Crucial Conversations, you've got to put it in your repertoire. I could do an all-day conference on Crucial Conversations, okay? It is, uh, and they actually have a wonderful website. Um, and so they, they send a blog each week. And they don't just cover education. This is, this is where the broad comes, right? Where it can be applied across the, any conversation you have to have with a spouse, a friend, a coworker, whoever, you know, when you're in opposing views about something. Um, so they have a wonderful uh, website as well. So anyways, this is where you've got opposing opinions. That's when a crucial conversation is going to happen. Or you have strong emotions. That's a crucial conversation. And when the stakes are high. So what happens if things don't go well with that parent in September? What are the stakes? If I don't deal with this the right way and handle it and approach it now, you know, our, our executive director, he'll always say, all right, I'm going to go eat my frog, right? Like nobody likes frog. Sorry. <coughs> Nobody likes to eat frogs. Um, so you take you know, a frog, and if you don't address it and handle it, 
all of a sudden you've got one of those really nasty things like the bullfrog toad things that you have to eat at some point that day, right? So we've got to have the ability, and the only way we're going to have the ability is if we are equipped ahead of time. That's what books like Crucial Conversations are about. So I just wanted to give you a few. Uh, these are discussion points, again, for your team. They're on your sheet. So you can talk about, like, like how can an SBAR work for us? Or is it time for that with that student? Or what, could, what if the parents are receptive? What if they are receptive? What are we gonna, how are we going to move forward? So lots of questions for you guys to talk about as your team. So kind of a, a main point to summarize um, and kind of wrap up our day today. So crucial conversations makes you stop, get out of the middle part of their brain, get out of your limbic, limbic system, and start thinking ahead of time and asking yourself when I go into this meeting, when I have this conversation, what do I really want here? It's not that you want Charlie to go away. You want things to be better for Charlie. You see him struggling every single day. Bless you. So you're going to ask, what do I really want for myself? How are you going to walk out of meeting and feel this? Yep. That, that went as I expected. I feel like I got my point across. What do you really want? What do I want for the others in that conversation? You don't want mom to be mad. You don't want dad to shut down. What do you really want? I want you guys to engage with me and partner so that Charlie can be successful. And what do I really want for our relationship? I don't care if it's September or May. You don't want to have a poor relationship with parents. So. When you start asking those questions, boom, you move out of those other parts of your brain and you start thinking logically about how you want things to happen. It literally turns off those other sections of your brain. So we're going to figure out how to achieve this and, okay, where we get what we want, they get what they need. Okay, how does that look? So you clarify what you really want and then you clarify what you really don't want. And this is the most diffusing thing that you can do in any conversation. Tell them what you don't want to happen in that meeting. We'll, we'll do it in a minute. And then you kind of put that together. So you kind of have a complex uh, statement where you're going to combine what you really want and what you really don't want. So the parent knows exactly where you stand, but they also understand that you're not trying to hurt them. You're not trying to make them upset. So what does it look like? Okay, I want Charlie to become more successful so socially and emotionally. I don't want other children to keep avoiding him because that's going to cause further outbursts and tears for Charlie, right? And then put it into an and, and this is a statement that you share. I want Charlie to grow socially and emotionally, and I don't want others leading uh, to avoid him, leading to further emotional outbursts. Therefore, that's your word. Don't ever use the word but when you are in a conversation with a parent because you just disqualified everything you said before it. This is how you achieve the and. The second time I've heard that today. Don't use the don't use the word but. Right, right. And that's probably like the third thing my staff hears all the time. Okay, so it's like a do-don't statement, right? It dispels this myth that somehow you don't care about Charlie or you have some sort of malicious intent towards Charlie or you don't respect them as parents. That's the don't part. And then it confirms and clarifies your real purpose. That's the do. That's the part you really do want. So what is that going to look like if I'm talking to a parent? I've noticed increasing emotional outbursts from Charlie when other students don't want to play f with him. I don't want Charlie to struggle or feel ostracized from his peers. I do want to implement some new strategies to increase his social emotional development. That includes getting him connected with our counselor. We might be able to discover some triggers or maybe some missing skills that we can be working on in the classroom. So just you know, think for a moment how that might be received versus your kid's heading every day, he's kicking every day, and we are kind of at our wit's end, right? And that's not productive. So anyway, so the idea that, um, you know, there's a little sample that you can try with your team there, uh, you know, where you go, okay, what I don't want, 
and what I do want. And I'm like five minutes over time. I know we started five minutes late, but I'm big on time. So I was going to you know, have you guys chit chat about it, whatever. But you guys could do that with your teams as well. So um, these are just some uh, initial thoughts and ideas that come from 26 years of working in education and ministry with parents and kids, uh, but it's also because I have an insatiable desire to read and read and read and read. And then guess what the next thing is? It's because I've had the hard conversations and I've botched them. And then I went, well, that wasn't good. <laughs> um, so, you know, then next time, okay, what am I going to do differently? Okay, well, that still wasn't great. Or, you know, take it, you know, get some self-awareness ourselves. Um, so what, what my hope is is that I know that you're going to experience challenges in your school, in your classrooms every single day. But maybe there's a little something that will add value to your ministry where you can have a better relationship and partnership with your parents, with each other. And that's really my hope. So um, anyways, yeah, there we go. There it is. So, uh, so there's my information, and you're welcome to email me. Let's say you want a digital copy of the documentation sample so your teachers can make them their own. I'm happy to email that to you. Or maybe you have something going on, you're like, hey, so how would I approach this situation? Remember, I love talking. There's my cell number. Call me. Um, so really, I mean it. Like, and, and I will probably glean so much from you. Know that every conversation I have with somebody, I'm taking something away from that because I recognize that all of you guys add value in some way. Um, so anyways, I'd love to um, you know, just be a resource or a help if you ever need it. But otherwise, thanks for your time today. All right.